Uh, hello everyone and thank you for making it to my talk as the last session of the conference. Um, how have you been enjoying the summit so far? Did you have a good event? Yes. Okay, um, so this talk will be about challenges and good and bad practices in the open source ecosystem. And the inspiration behind the talk is the fact that open source has been going through an exponential growth. And whenever a project, uh, a group, anything that goes through rapid growth, that is always challenging. And therefore, we need to recognize what works, what doesn't work, and how we can all work together to improve that. So um, before I go into details, who am I? Why am I talking about this? So my name is Ildi Kovancha. I work as Director of Community at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Um, I have a bit over 11 years of open source experience under my belt. I actually started with OpenStack, as my swag shows. Um, that was my very first um, getting involved open source experience. So that was the community where I kind of learned what open source really was and what community really <coughs> meant. And within uh, my current role, I do focus on open the challenges of open collaborative software development and working with both individuals as well as companies to overcome those and help them to get involved in projects that are important to them and that they do rely on. And since we are talking about experiences in the ecosystem, that involves every single one of you who are in this room or who are following this talk on the other side of the camera uh, as you're watching the recording of this session. So I would like to learn a little bit about you. First, um, who is using open source during your day job, daily activities? Raise your hands any tool that you're using that is open source or you're working on a project or product that depends on open source software. Okay, I did see, yeah, one third half-ish of the room. So um, those, those of you who raised your hand, are you sure that you know about every single bit and piece that is open source in the technologies that you are relying on? Who thinks that you do? Okay. <laughs> A little less um, confidence in the room about this one. So uh, what if I say that if you, if you look up current numbers, then we can kind of confidently say that over 80% of a modern global, global software infrastructure is open source, depends on open source, has open source components in it. So we don't really have much today that we rely on that has absolutely nothing to do with open source. Does this surprise anyone in the room? <laughs> so open source is actually uh, much more significant in our lives than one might think about. So it's more than just the Linux kernel at this point. So um, what is your role in all this then? Um, do we have anyone in the room who's contributing to any open source project, either as a personal hobby and, and interest or as part of your job? No hands. Um, then you're probably also not a maintainer in any open source uh, project. How about managing teams who contribute to open source projects? No. no? Okay. Do you have any activity that does relate to open source at all? Is there anything that I haven't listed but you're doing already? other than attending this event, because that is already a contribution. Actually, I just contributed to Firebase project. Nice. Then you are a contributor if you already contributed. <laughs> Every little bit counts. And actually, one of the, the big points of this talk is that 
um, open source is much beyond the code. So every little bit like your contribution did help and does help those communities where you're contributing and participating. And even attending events like this one is participation because you are in the ecosystem, you're talking to people who are already experts and contributors. You might be looking into how to use open source software and learning about it. And once you learned, you can help others to understand better as well. So uh, on that note, what is open source? Because as I talk to people, open source means a lot of things to a lot of people. Now, if you uh, look into existing resources, um, the open source definition from the open source initiative is where people land first and foremost, because this is the definition that defines open source in license terms. So this tells you what you can do um, or what the licenses need to, um, what requirements they need to fulfill, um, and how to define what you can do with the open source code and artifacts and what you cannot. So this is open source um, as a definition from a license perspective. Now, if you look further, then you can find other sources where open source is defined in some shape or form. So I went to one of the most highly utilized uh, places on the internet that people very often use as a source of truth, Wikipedia, and looked up what Wikipedia had to say about open source. And if you read through the long text, then you can see that there is a mention of um, licensing in Wikipedia's definition as well, as there should be. But if you look at the, uh, the highlighted text, then you can see that, the, that Wikipedia's description, definition, um, whatever you want to call it, um, talks about how open source software is created and how it is actually a product of collaborative uh, development. So it recognizes that open source goes beyond the code and artifacts that these communities are producing and it really looks into how those artifacts are being made. So um, in order to understand the open source ecosystem a little bit better, um, I have a co-conspirator called Phil Robb, who is not here today. Uh, he is actually on the Open Infra Foundation Board of Directors. And we set out to dig a little bit deeper and see what individuals and also corporate organizations are experiencing when they are using uh, open source software or um, are considering or already participating in any of the communities because we do recognize that this open collaborative software development method is not straightforward. Um, it is often hard. And getting involved usually starts with a lot of head scratching, both from individual perspective as well as from companies and organizations perspective in terms of where do I even start with this if I don't already have experience. So we started to talk to a lot of people and we turned that into a podcast, uh, which is called uh, My Open Source Experience Podcast. Um, you can grab the links from the slide. Um, it is on YouTube. You can get it through RSS feed, uh, podcast platforms. And uh, you can listen to our chats with both experts in the field, as well as newcomers, community members, people who are looking into open source contribution because their companies are using um, open source software or creating products that are relying on open source software. So this talk is summarizing what we've learned so far from talking to people who are, in a lot of ways, um, having more experience or just you know smarter than us. Um, and there's one thing that we ask every single person who we interview on the podcast, which is they uh, need to tell us what open source means to them. So we make them say the sentence, open source <coughs> is, and then they say the first word or term or expression that comes to their minds. And I, like, I used 
I forgot to add the attribution for the software that I used, which is my mistake. I will uh, fix that. But I used uh, an online tool to create a word cloud um, that highlights what people said the most. And you can see that it is like people's um, responses are kind of in line with those two definitions that, that you can very easily find on the internet, um, where there were some people who associated to open source being a license type first and foremost. And you can see that community is written with the largest font, which means that uh, that was the most commonly mentioned word that people said when we asked them to say what open source means to them, what they associate to. So I think this word, word cloud really clearly shows the, the two big sides of, of open source, what the term really is representing, and the two don't really work without the other one. So what are the current um, challenges in the open source ecosystem and what might be some of the solutions to them. Let's look at this from community perspective first. Um, so I talked about how the open source ecosystem is going through kind of a rapid growth. And some of the trends that you might see as part of that rapid growth is that there are quite a lot of single vendor projects out there. Now their code is still under an open source license. Um, companies decide to open source their code uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it's for marketing purposes. Sometimes um, they really do want to build a diverse community around it. Um, as two examples, but there are many, many more. Um, like it seemed like a good idea at the time, or my competitor was doing the same thing. Um, so companies go and do release some code and put an open source license on it. So technically it is open source. However, they often don't take or don't succeed with taking the next steps of growing and diversifying the community uh, around that code. So they are the most dominant contributing um, organization to that code. And that can be a challenge, especially if they do it on purpose. Now, um, the problem with single vendor projects is that on one hand, the ecosystem keeps growing and growing. In many cases, you can find alternatives to projects. So you might post the question why people are trying to do the same thing at multiple places. How a user is supposed to figure out which project to use. Um, and then you can also look at it from individual perspective. Like if you're new to the open source ecosystem and the single vendor project is your only experience in open source where there isn't a high degree of that diverse collaborative software development going on, then that experience isn't really um, telling you what open source really is and how it really works. So it gives you a bit of a false picture about what community is supposed to be all about. Because the idea behind open source is to not replicate what you do in the proprietary environment, but work with others from other organizations, other parts of the globe, and um, make your project successful and also sustainable in the long term. So this is where, on one hand, everyone who has experience in the ecosystem, um, working with diverse communities, we all have a responsibility to do some education and help others to understand uh, what open source really is about. On the other hand, uh, open source program offices can be a really good um, step for a corporate organization to figure out how to uh, turn their new open source project into a thriving, su uh, succeeding, and sustainable open source community which then will help them with a lot of things beyond just having some marketing out there. Now, when it comes to single vendor projects, when these projects are kind of controlled by a single corporate organization, 
sometimes you can see that they eventually decide to change the license of that code because if they are uh, the only contributors to the project or there are just a handful of people where they can reach out about the license change, then, then they are able to, to do that. Um, this model is also often called bait and switch um, because it is actually something that venture capital um, organizations sometimes tell companies that it's a great idea. I listed some examples like Elasticsearch and Terraform uh, where this happened, where the companies had an open source project and then you know they had an ecosystem with users and all of a sudden they decided that now this is a business source, uh, a business license uh, source available, um, but in in every case, not an OSI compliant license. So the project was not open source anymore. So they closed closed down the ecosystem, and that is a method that is very very harmful to the open source ecosystem at large. Because on one hand, people lose trust in open source projects because you cannot trust that the code will be open source tomorrow as well and that is a big problem because then what do you do if you already are relying on some of that open source code you're running it in production if you're if you're an if you're an operator so what comes next from that point now um, you can also see that both of the examples that I that I have on the top I also have on the bottom because um, the community finds a way, which usually means that they fork these projects. So um, Elasticsearch turned into OpenSearch and Terraform turn in, turned into OpenTofu. So it is also a message to those companies who choose these methods because even though you decide that now your code is proprietary and your customers will be your customers and competitors uh, should not have uh, access to that code anymore, they can still decide that they use the last available open source version and just keep developing that under a new project because they can do that because the code is open source so it is available for everyone to do whatever they want with it and um, actually there is a very interesting development um, I don't know if you're aware, but Elasticsearch just recently announced that they are now having a new license for the project, uh, an AGPL license. So they are kind of stumbling back into the open source ecosystem. So it's really interesting to, to follow how that all will play out, but I cannot give you an update about that because they just announced that, I think, um, end of last week or so. So it, it is a very, very recent news. So that is why my slides are kind of not reflecting that yet, because I don't know what's going to happen, but it's already very, very interesting. Now, I already mentioned that open source is a license type. However, the challenge with that is that um, individuals and or companies don't always really look into what those licenses grant you and what they don't and how they work. And it is actually really important to understand the license um, behind um, these software projects and there are some common misconceptions about open source licenses like which one is permissive and which one is not permissive technically and practically every single OSI compliant open source license is permissive however what you need to understand is which license um, uh, requires you to um, open source and contribute back the changes that you made to the code downstream because the copyleft licenses um, can you can you can break those licenses if you make changes downstream and you don't give them back um, so you need to understand the implications of the licenses but um, it is a misconception that there are some open source licenses that are not permissive because all of them are now, I also mentioned it already that while it is a license type, open source projects do not work without community. So if you don't have the people who are uh, working upstream in those communities, then you have a version of the code, but no one will you know, fix bugs, add new features. So it is something that we all need to think about and um, constantly keep in mind. Like, if you're an individual, but especially if you're a corporate organization who's depending on an open source project, like, again, you're using it as part of your tooling to um, produce your products, 
or it is actually part of your <coughs> product or service. Um, like, um, if, if you're depending on that software to that level, then you also need to consider the risks that you face if you don't invest in that project to maintain it and develop it towards the direction that you actually would like it to go. So it is, if you're, if you're relying on open source software, it is to some extent your responsibility as well to maintain and keep developing that software because there's no guarantee that others in the ecosystem will keep doing that for you. So free and open source software where the word free is not as in beer. So it's, it's not about uh, free of charge, it is about the freedom to decide what you do with that code. And that is a very, very important distinction. Now, there are a lot of regulations and legislations that are coming out all around the globe. I listed a few, like the CRA or the uh, Securing Open Source Software uh, Act. Uh, from Europe and uh, the United States of America because those are the, the regions that I'm more familiar with, but I know that there are more legislations around the globe than just that, these, these two and these few. Um, so that is something that all of us in the ecosystem, either depending on, on, on code or already participating in communities, need to follow and understand. And here the educational piece kicks in again because Governments need to understand how open source works because otherwise you can end up with laws and, and uh, legislations and regulations that are harmful to the ecosystem that can practically paralyze communities like uh, the Cyber Resiliency Act and uh, Product Liability Directive, which the two acronyms on the slide uh, stand for. Um, in the early iterations, it wasn't very clear like how liability uh, will be treated when it comes to open source communities. Like to mention an example, if you're an individual contributing code to an open source project, which then is being picked up by either companies or the government itself, and then there's a bug in it, and maybe the bug was in your contribution, are you personally liable for any of the consequence that bug caused? Or is it the company who uh, started to use that software and redistribute, um, who didn't catch it and didn't contribute back a fix? Are they reliable, like, uh, liable? Like, who is responsible? to fix things and who's responsible for any harm that was caused by using that software somewhere. Um, so these are all really important aspects um, that, again, all of us in the ecosystem who have understanding of open source, we are responsible to help all these entities to understand as well how all this works and uh, try to avoid that individuals um, will not be dragged into court and prison just, you know, because they made something available that they personally were not benefiting from and they just wanted to share with everybody uh, to say that, hey, it's useful for me and if it's useful for you too, then please use it, otherwise don't. Um, so it would be a really, really sad um, outcome if we would not be able to have open source software and open source communities anymore because the regulations don't allow um, that anymore. Now, um, there's another area that is always a really hot topic, which is security. Um, obviously, as we are living a more and more digital life, um, digital and cyber security becomes more and more crucial and important. Now, if, you, if you're not familiar with open source and you just do like sort of a blind search on the internet in your favorite search engine, about open source security, then the first two headlines will be open source software is the most secure software out there that you can find. And the second one will be that it's the least secure option that you can possibly use. Now, again, if you're not familiar with open source, then it is really confusing. Like, it doesn't help you figure out how to um, determine whether a project itself is secure or not, what you should do, what you should not do. 
And if you're, again, not familiar with open source, then it could also just turn you away from, from op using open source code, even though there are some projects which are, which are exceptionally secure, and yes, there are some which are not, but you have access to the code, so you always have the choice of securing the code and harden it and, uh, and fix security bugs and vulnerabilities in it. And it is also all of our responsibilities as people who are participating in communities to make sure that the software that we are producing is in fact secure and once we have an identified vulnerability, it is fixed. And one more thing that might be um, important to you in the room who uh, who don't seem to contribute code today, but you might already be doing something that helps an open source project um, in some way, like you're providing feedback or you submitted a bug report because you tried something and it didn't work and you wanted to, wanted to let the community know. Um, so it is kind of another misconception that when we say contributor that equals code developers, yes, Majority, big chunks uh, of the, the contributors are code developers, but that is not the only way to help and advance an open source community and project. Because giving feedback to people who are working on software and documentation, whether or not it works, whether or not it delivers what is promised, uh, and what the community uh, is set out to implement, that is crucial and very valuable information to that community. So if you are able to give feedback, give a talk at a conference like this one, um, submit a bug report, <coughs> write an email to the mailing list even with a question that can help someone else understand what, um, what you have as question as well, those are all, all contributions. So being involved doesn't mean that you have to write code. Now, um, I will look at the time, and I have four more minutes, so I will rush through a few more slides, and then um, I will open up the floor uh, for questions, and if anyone wants to share a, a relevant experience that you have. So uh, let's take just a very brief view uh, on the corporate side of open source, like again, companies uh, relying on open source software one way or the other, um, and the ecosystem from, from their perspective. Um, one thing that, that most people talk about who uh, talk about open source from corporate perspective is that if you are an employee who is trying to work on open source as part of their job, it gets really, really hard to justify uh, that to management and company leadership very, very often. Like, yeah, we, we are relying on this code, it was free on the internet, so we downloaded it. It already took us a lot of time and effort to do integration work or you know proprietary software development around that open source code. So why on earth would we invest in the open source project itself? Now that is one of the biggest mistakes that a company can do because as I, as I talked about it earlier, um, it is a common, uh, it is all our common responsibility to make sure that we do maintain those projects that we do rely on on a daily basis or that, or those projects that actually give the basis of our livelihoods. So that investment is actually crucial for the community, but it is also crucial for the corporate organization who is relying on that open source code because that's the only way to, um, end up with sustainable maintenance cost, lowering the risk, um, like from the perspective of the whole entire product service or product development workflow. Because again, if something is broken in the open source code, there is zero guarantees that someone else will fix that bug because maybe they are not impacted by it because they are using some other parts of that, that open source code. So um, yes. Justifying why to work on open source is really hard, and that still to this day requires a lot of um, education that, again, we are all responsible for doing, and where OSPO's open source program office is coming to the picture again, because getting involved in open source is actually a strategic investment, 
and it is a misconception and mistake not to make that investment and try to solve everything in a proprietary closed manner because if you're relying on open source code and the things that you're fixing you're maintaining it in-house because the license did not require you to um, fix those things upstream in the open source code, then maintaining those changes only downstream, that will, the maintenance cost for those changes will go up and at one point you will not be able to um, integrate those into the newer and newer open source releases. That is one of the, the common huge challenges that, that companies face. Now the other, the other challenge is that once the company actually did decide to, okay, let's make that investment and let's get involved, but how do I do that? There are some textbooks, uh, te text books <laughs> out there to, uh, to help you, um, but it is still something that, that companies and individuals are trying to figure out what method works best. The slide does have an example that we talked about with people on the podcast a few times uh, about a model that, that companies have been um, experimenting with. Um, and if anyone in the room or who's watching offline uh, has experience with it, we would love to know. The model says that you can divide your workforce and, and teams in a way where you have 5% of the people allocated to work on the open source project full time, you have 15% of the people who are bouncing and, and have kind of a um, part-time allocation to open source, to the open source project, as well as a part-time allocation to product work. And the remaining 80% works on the product or service that the company is selling. And what this model gives you is that you have involvement and investment in those open source projects that the company uh, relies on. So you have the ability to fix things that, that are broken and impacting you. You also have um, the way and method to influence the direction where to which the, uh, the open source project is going. So when you need a feature, you, you actually have control over contributing that feature and, and, and having that accepted by the open source community. While at the same time, you still have 80% of the people who will work on your product so you can keep your uh, product release schedule, keep your customers happy, and, uh, and keep your business um, afloat and going again to the direction that you set out for the company to, uh, to go. So this is one way of doing it. We are not saying that this is the only way to do it. Um, we'd love to learn. Um, what experience you all are having. And um, I already uh, stressed this um, at the beginning, and I'm already over time, uh, I think. So um, modern software development uh, is based on open source and solutions are based on open source. So the sustainability of the supply chain is all of our responsibility and we are facing with a lot of challenges like maintainer burnout, um, abandoned projects, they might have been one of the single vendor projects that they just, the company just pulled out, not doing that anymore. The, the sec security and vulnerability issues and how the XE backdoor um, vulnerability was actually discovered because the code was open source. Otherwise we might have not known for a few more years that it had that vulnerability. So um, there are a lot of things to address in the ecosystem and this is where we want to learn about your experience, your questions. Do you want to get involved? Uh, do you need the, the help to take the first step? Are you already involved and facing a challenge or do you have a good experience that you want to share with, with others so they can do the same thing and have a great experience in and with open source? And with that, this was my talk and I would love to talk to all of you. <laughs> and yeah. So this concludes my, my talk, and I don't know if you have any questions or any experience that you would, would you would like to share. <laughs> uh, what's your first experience to contribute to open source?
So my very first experience was the OpenStack project, and it was 11 years ago. So I did start to contribute to a project that was called Salometer. I don't think the project is still actively maintained anymore. It was a metering uh, support system project. So it was monitoring how much resources were used when you were running an OpenStack cloud. And I was contributing to that project on behalf of Ericsson, who I was working for at that time. So um, I discovered the project through my employment, and that's how I learned more about open source and open source communities, which then became also my personal interest and passion at the same time as well, because um, I personally like these communities because I'm surrounded with people who have similar interests that I do and we are all in those communities to achieve a common goal and therefore people in the communities are really focused on that goal that they have, they care about the project and I personally like that environment, it's really inspiring and there are a lot of people in that environment that, that I could learn from. Uh, and to this day, when, whenever I, I go to a new project, there are a lot of experts there and I always learn something new. So um, I think the, uh, the ecosystem is amazing and uh, I just, I liked it so much that eventually I joined the, uh, the Open Infrastructure Foundation to help and support communities to um, become successful and sustainable. Any other questions? or any experience that you all want to share. If not, then we can conclude the talk and I'm here uh, if, you want to, if you want to chat um, outside of the video recording and microphones. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any further questions that, or, or have a conversation about open source. Thank you.